So uh, again, let us start. If you have any problem in, vis uh, in visualizing my slides, please let me know because I can't uh, make out. So uh, when we see these complex defects, we have a gamut of problems that we need to address. And these are, as you can see in this patient and this uh, photograph which I have documented, is that there is an infratemporal fossa hollow. There is the loss of the mandible. There is loss of lining. There's loss of cover. And there is some submandibular hollow which will be created because of the neck dissection, etc., which we also need to address. So when we are trying to address these sort of complex defects, it is uh, difficult to satisfy this with one single flap. So we are always looking for options to provide multiple components in these sort of defects. So multiple flaps, of course, we can use. We can use different donor sites with multiple flaps. And of course, that has its disadvantages. So this is an illustration of a patient. And you can see the extent of the lower lip, the cheek, the mandible, upper jaw, upper lip has been excised. And we've used two flaps, which can be two free flaps, a combination of a free and pedicle flaps, or even two pedicle flaps for that matter. Of course, the disadvantages is the operating time the logistics, the manpower required, etc. So what is the next option? So you can harvest uh, two free flaps from the same donor site, example, ALT and an AMT flap, anterior medial thigh and anterior lateral thigh flaps. Of course, these are all dependent on the perforators that are available, and it leaves a large raw area in the donor site which needs to be grafted. We cannot close this primarily. And of course, these have some technical demand. And of course, uh, these areas are not always available to us. So we move on to the topic today is that to harvest multiple flaps based on a single donor vessel, what we call chimeric flaps. You, I think everybody knows about chimeric flaps and what they really R4. So there are two types of chimeric flaps. So one is a branch based and one is the perforator based. We are going to talk today mostly on the perforator based chimeric flaps, but branch based would be an example would be, uh, let's say we combine a, a, a ALT flap with the TFL flap. So that from the transverse branch and the descending branch. So that would be a branch based system. That is also a classical chimeric flap, but our focus would be on perforators. So we are looking at a single vascular system, which is going to provide perforators and provide multiple components, which we can separate out safely and provide reconstruction options. So let us move on to some theory. Now, I think, again, you all are all familiar with this classification. Nakajima in 86 described this classification in which he described direct perforators and indirect perforators. And the direct perforators were from the source vessel, the perforators would directly go to the skin, which could be uh, septocutaneous or direct cutaneous, or it could be indirect perforators, which are uh, uh, arising like a musculocutaneous perforator, goes into the muscle and then supplies the skin or passes in between fascicles of the muscle and then provides the skin, the septocutaneous perforator. And these have been grouped into multiple types, one to five, which is the, which, which it's. His, uh, in general, his article was not at all given much recognition, only when much later on did this article come into vogue, and now it is a standard to quote this article whenever you're discussing for perforator flaps. So the other uh, classification, which was by Huang et al., and uh, I would suggest the younger guys to look into the article by Halock also, which describes the general understanding of perforators. Uh, one point about nomenclature is that the perforators are named after the source vessel. So if it is an uh, 
ALT flap, let's say, then the main perforator would be from the descending branch of the lateral circumflex. So ALCF perforator flap. So that is how they said. So now, if you look at this, there are types of combined flaps. So these are all combined flaps in the sense that there is a natural combination. If you look at the illustration on top, which is a branch base, that means from the source vessel, there is a branch coming out. Then that branch again subdivides, and each of these perforators can independently support a tissue. But naturally, this is present. So you might have a large part of a skin or a muscle with multiple perforators supplying it. But each of the perforator would be able to supply one unit of the muscle, one three-dimensional tissue component. So that is a branch base. You can have an independent, that means you have a supply on either end, let's say, or a muscle separately and a skin separately, which in fact is a complex. But these can be segregated also, or you can have a branch base, as I already mentioned the, uh, in the earlier disc. Now, the chimeric is when we divide this branch base, let's say, into two components, each independent of each other, they are not in contact, then it becomes a perforator base chimeric flap. So we have divided this skin, which was, it's an extension of the diagram on top, or we, from the same branches, we have segregated uh, different components, let's say the skin separately from the muscle separately, so that. The next sort of classification is the fabricated, which is the topic of our discussion today, is where we artificially create, means that means we microsurgically create these sort of perforators and link various components, which can be sequential or it can be internal, depending on, depending on the branching patterns that we can see in these sort of patients. So we, we need to understand this uh, to understand this uh, perforator concept. So this is again the same thing. It's a little uh, expanded to show you how the sequential and the internal fabricated pattern, these are microsurgically created by perforator to perforator anastomosis to reconstruct and you can have a variety of combinations of what tissue you want to. The other classification system which, uh, which I have uh, had the privilege of seeing is uh, one by JT Kim from uh, Seoul, Korea. And in his book, he has published this classification which is a little more, uh, I would say, confusing, but it is much, more, much more in detail. Okay, so if you see, he is described type one, which is the naturally occurring, which is classical uh, chimerism, where you have a muscle skin component from one branch and a terminal flap at the other end, which is chimerism by, uh, which is uh, flaps based on named source vessels. So one P, would be if you have a perforator at one of its site. So if you have a perforator which is going through a tissue and you've taken the skin only on that and based on that perforator, then it becomes a 1P. So this is classical. And a type 2 would be where one of the segments has been added onto it. So let's say you've put in an intestine or maybe a muscle or a bone and hooked onto it by microsurgical. So type 2 has variations and you can have uh, with the perforator flap, the perforator flap add on to that flap, so it comes as a 2P. So when you have type 3 is when you have only the perforator flap at its tips, multiple branches as a component, and I will come to all these examples at subsequent level. And when any of these two are combined, it becomes a type 4. So you have a variety of combinations, permutations, and there are some uh, other classification systems also when we look at perforators but I think it's better to keep the thing simple. So the general idea is there is a naturally occurring perforator pattern, which is of course uh, designed by the anatomy that is prevalent in that patient, and the other one that we can ourselves reconstruct. So uh, we need to understand the general approach when we do perforator flaps is that we have a conventional approach that means where we work from the source vessel and go out. Let's say we do a latissimus dorsi flap, then we go from the thoracodorsal pedicle and find out our 
skin muscle component and then lift our flap and then divide it and separate it. Let's say we can take a serratus with its serratus branch. So that is a conventional chimeric flap. But when we do perforator flap, we usually work from outside to in. That means from the surface inwards. So that means we work from the skin surface and then start segregating each component that we need to separate so that we don't have much morbidity and we can spare tissue that we don't need to harvest. So these are the two basic concepts that uh, I just wanted to emphasize. So when we look at multiple flaps from the same donor site, there are some systems that we commonly follow. And I'll try and give you examples from most of this. So you have the lateral circumflex femoral system, the subscapular, the peroneal, and the radial vascular system. So let's start with the ALT flap or one based on the lateral circumflex femoral artery system. That means conventional perforator from the lateral circumflex femoral. So if you look at this, then we have, oh sorry, the animations are not working. So you can see that we have we have a system of uh, vessels which are supplying the lateral circumflex femoral vessels. So that means this is the descending branch of the lateral circumflex femoral, if you can make out. And of course, we have the vastus lateralis and the fascia. And commonly, we use the perforator, the main perforator, which everybody is aware about, which is the perforator supplying the skin on the lateral surface of the thigh. Most of the time, often we have other perforators from the same branch, from the same descending branch, which is also supplying, which may not be the main perforator, but they are sizable perforators, and we can use these sort of vessels to reconstruct. Other than that, we also have the transverse branch uh, from the lateral circumflex femoral, which is also supplying this part of the skin, though a little bit cranially. So we have multiple components which we can harvest. And if we harvest that, then we can then move around and become flexible in using this sort of a tissue. So if you look at this, so this is the flap harvested, multiple perforators. The one at 12 o'clock position are your main pedicle and perforators, and we have other small perforators on either side, which we have included. And these are all supplying independent territories within this skin component. So if you can somehow link this to each other, you will be able to create certain components which are different to us. Now you look at this, this is the ALT flap again, and you have we have harvested two perforators. Now, these two perforators, there's a main perforator which is going and penetrating and supplying the skin, and there is another secondary perforator. Same with this, and this skin has been divided. Now, the movement of this perforate, the movement of this flap or the different components would be dependent on the extent or length of this perforator. So, if the length is long, then you can move it further. But if it is shorter, then the movement becomes compromised. So this is one limitation of these sort of anatomical variations, which we cannot predict, but which is dependent on the anatomy per se on the patients. So again, it will also depend on the length to so the number of perforators that is there, which again cannot be predicted, and position of the recipient vessels and how you do it. So we want these two skin islands when we divide it to move, and that may not be practical depending uh, on what we have at that point of time. So this is the patient and you can see this is one patient example to show you. Now we have a branch pattern here and a separate uh, perforator on, uh, on the right. So you can divide this theoretically into three components, so three parts of the flap, but the movement of each would be dependent on the movement of these perforators. So some would be a short pedicle and some would be a sort of a long pedicle as that can be seen. So you can divide this and make. So this is a sort of perforator based chimerism that can be designed to create flaps here. So what is fabrication? Fabrication is, as you must have seen from the classification, is an internal rearrangement of perforators by linking together in order to design a flap to match the donor defect. So we are trying to create 
a chimeric flap by anastomosing tissues at different places so that it matches what our defect is. So let's take the example that I had illustrated initially. The same patient with a large uh, lesion and the components, multiple components, and we said that we will try and address some of these. Now you can use deepithelized flaps, you can use multiple components flaps. So what we did was we took an ALT flap, and this is the ALT flap at its donor site. You can see the two perforators with the loop around it uh, before it was detached. So once it is detached, now you see we have one independent perforator which is not linked to the source vessel. It could have been linked to the source vessel if you, and we would have had to do an extensive dissection to provide it. And we have the main perforator with this perforator branch. And of course, we carried a little more muscle along with this. So we have basically got two components in present. So once we link one of these vessels to a side branch of this, now we have, we can divide it as you can see from the dotted line and we have three components. So from that defect, from one basic flap, we now are left with three uh, components, which we can then adjust and move on any way we want to provide the flap. So this is the patient after it's inset, not very clear, but this is how he looks post immediate surgery and post radiotherapy, which most of these patients get. The commissure is in normal position and it's otherwise well contoured. So this in a way sorts out some of the problems that we have from a single donor site. So we are addressing from a single donor site. Another lady, T4, N2, M0, extensive defect with a large fungating mass involving the right side of the cheek. And post resection, you can see extensive excision of both the external as well as internal skin, the part of the alveolus, upper alveolus, part of the mandible, and intra infratemporal fossa clearance by the head and neck team. And uh, we are left with a sizable defect like this. And uh, obviously you can do two flaps, you can do multiple other procedures, but one of the options is to do fabricated flaps, sorry. So this is the patient, uh, this patient you can see. I'm sorry, the animations are not working, so you will have to bear with me. So that is the ALT flap at the upper left-hand side of your box, which shows you the perforators with the background uh, behind it the main perforator and a single perforator. Again, uh, linked to a side branch as is shown here. And this is the uh, expanded view to show you that you have we have done it. We do all these procedures on the table, usually after detachment of the flap in especially ALT cases because the vessels are small. We have also done it in situ with, while the flap is being perfused, but it is a slightly difficult because positioning may be an issue. We don't get too much length of these perforators, so adjusting these may sometimes become a problem. So it suits you. So I will, there will be some questions on whether you can clamp a vessel after it has been detached, et cetera. That you, we used to be our apprehension initially, but that is now no more. So this is the same lady, as you can see, the external skin, part of the palate, buccal mucosa has been addressed. And this, with, and this gives us a semblance of result and addresses the defect in another patient. You can see that uh, how we have uh, addressed this, more same story. Now these perforators, as I said, from the lateral circumflex humoral, you can see that the perforators are around 0.5 to 0.8 millimeter diameter, and we can put in five to six sutures on that. And I think everybody is nowadays competent to do small vessel anastomosis without any problem. So the question comes, can we predict, means pre-plan. Can we pre-plan that, okay, today we are going to do a multiple perforator flaps, and we will do uh, some sort of a fabrication also we try to do that uh, looking at CT angios. And you, as, see, as seen from here, you can see multiple perforators are lo localized here. But often this does not match what we see in the uh, operative anatomy when we are doing the operative anatomy. So, and then the diameters are uh, really not predictable. 
and we cannot say that we are going to link this perforator. So let's say to the bottom one and we can get a, a, a multiple flaps. So the mm, point is that we can only decide on all this intra-op when we are doing the procedure. If we get these perforators and they are sizable and we think we are comfortable with this, then we can move on and do this sort of perforator. Another such patient where we need to differentially position. That means this is a tongue defect and a floor of the mouth. So we needed a part of the tongue ventral surface. If you put one single flap, what happens is it tethers the tongue. So we started doing a few cases here. And this is two flaps, again, linked together, as you can see. And we usually put a suture there to prevent all that. And this is linked by a small vessel at uh, from the side. And this has been inset in two different planes. And this was possible by uh, linking this. Usually, we do not suture these two flaps. So we allow the tongue to move a little bit. This allows that the tongue can have some sort of a mobility. I don't know whether this is practical or not, but we try and do that philosophically. That's what we are attempting it. Now the radial forearm flap or from the radial vascular system. I think the radial forearm flap is one of the most commonest flaps that we use, but we are trying to push the use of this flap and uh, its application to different levels and it's a very quick flap and easy flap to do. I think it is everybody is uh, probably conversant with this, but I would like to uh, raise a few issues which I will tell you just now. So look at the anatomy here. So when we do head and neck big defects, I'm talking about big defects, then we do a distally based radial forearm flap. That means we <clears throat> use the distal pedicle as the uh, donor donor vessel. Uh, so the vessels are actually small. So the why we do that is because we have a larger part of the skin on the forearm, which can be taken, and that is an area over muscle which will definitely accept graft. And I think it's a little more cosmetically better because on the muscle the graft take is there. There's no tendon exposure, etc. Uh, one disadvantage is that we don't have too many perforators proximally as we have in the distal third of the forearm. So you need to be careful in selecting what you're going to do. So proximally, that means near the elbow, you will find there is a, there are constant big vessels supplying the muscle. So the brachioradialis or one of the flexor group of muscles, you will find branches coming from the radial artery and supply. This is in 90% of the cases, we have found it. We have done, we've done about six to eight patients in which we have seen that this perforator is constant. Now, this perforator, the advantage is we can hook up another flap in this area. It is easier to do. Instead of folding two flaps into two, uh, the forearm flap into two, which is again possible, or making it into two islands, which are on the same axis, then we have to fold it. We can hitch two flaps on either side and that is more easy without the problem of kinking. Let me give you one example. So this is a patient, again, wide excision surgery, and this is how we have designed the uh, distally based radial forearm flap. You can see the flap has been elevated, and we are going to take detach it at the wrist and use that flap for anastomosis. Now you will notice here in the image, that I'm pointing to, the yellow arrow, will show you a large perforator here. And this was going to the proximal skin area. This was going right up to the proximal skin area. So this flap was then from that elbow area detached and then transferred and combined with this. So you will see if this works. So if you can see this, so you will see that we have anastomosed that perforator to one of the side branches, which I showed you in the earlier slide, uh, to the side branch, and that allowed us to harvest in a larger area of skin, and we could divide it and insert it, as you can see in this patient, in the early and the late post-op period. So now we come to the peroneal system. 
we are uh, in fact uh, mostly done most of these work on the peroneal system and we are uh, more comfortable with that and that provides us a lot of flexibility again uh, referring to jt kim's uh, classification system this is part of the options that are available in the fibula osteoglossus flat so if you look at the diagram and i would suggest that you can if anybody is interested i can send them these uh, across is that how he has classified them into a classical branch based to branch based but with the fascia only intact then again you can take muscle on a perforator and he carries on permutation and combination to a perforator base this is the classical pattern and the subsequent one are the perforator base which are branch and again only cutaneous and again muscle on a perforator skin on a perforator bone on the main vessel so you can have a variety of combinations and again you can join uh components to it and create and fabricate flaps as it is so let us go through what i really want to say so <clears throat> ct angiogram lower limb we usually this is not a practice uh, in our fibula harvest but uh, we were doing it for a study and i will tell you why so this is the peroneal system we are looking at the peroneal system which of course everybody is aware the popliteal vessel divides into uh, anterior tibial branch classically that's the pattern first anterior tibial comes then there is a common tibio peroneal trunk and that provides the peroneal and the posterior tibial vessels so that's the classical division pattern of this now from the peroneal multiple perforators arise which supplies the skin on the lateral surface of the leg and um, it would be really uh interesting to note that when this uh, fibula was uh, published it was considered that the skin islands were safe uh, were totally unsafe i'm sorry beg your pardon it was unsafe and we could not uh, rely on skin islands now we have extended the application to such an extent that we can we all our skin islands are 100% reliable and in fact we can play around with this for quite an extensive area so next we move on to happened is not moving okay so you can take skin islands you can take skin islands um as is the classical description in the fibula and we can we can take it on the distal distal uh, branches perforators which we can again divide into a single perforator or multiple perforator depending on what is available so conventional practice the fibula we are skin islands is at the lower third of the leg and we can have one or two skin islands on the perforator this is the classical we also have so let's move on to a few examples so this is what we do so we can have an intrinsic branch base that means this is what the anatomy is telling us this is naturally present and we have not fabricated it but we can divide these components into multiple chimeric flaps and you can see that uh, it has been divided into bone and skin component little muscle and little skin here and there so that is one example again another example to show you multiple components of the fibula this is all so these are multiple independent territories supplied by the same source vessel so if we do one anastomosis all these areas would be perfused and these tissues because of their potential length of the perforators we can align them and put them in different areas again to show you one example this is a patient extensive defect external skin mandible and outer ching and upper alveolus and we tend to get a lot of these uh, patients uh, advanced diseases and hence we uh, can 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 do these sort of reconstructions so this is a conventional fibula uh flap with two islands all these we do on the table uh while the flap is being perfused on the leg and then we detach it and insert it as and when required and this is the patient as you can see it is resurfaced the palate as well as the skin and part of the buccal mucosa this gives us a lot of flexibility 
to orient the skin or a single donor site, we've been able to assess this. So that is for perforators at the distal part of the leg that we have used. Now we realized we needed more components. This two was insufficient. We could get, take two islands and muscle, but we couldn't take more skin. So we started taking the proximal peroneal perforator. The proximal peroneal perforator, leg peroneal perforator was described by uh, Kawamura from Japan in 2005, and this has now become the mainstay in our reconstruction for large complex defects of the head and neck. So you can see the proximal peroneal perforator is much more proximally situated, and I will come to the anatomy of this. I hope you'll be able to see this uh, video. I don't know. I hope I'll just play it. So you. I hope you can see that this proximal peroneal perforator is a muscular cutaneous perforator. So it is situated. You can see the perforator. It pierces the gastrosoleus muscle and then skirts around the fibula. So the conventional perforators in the distal leg are septocutaneous, but here it is a muscular cutaneous perforator. So you will see the main perforator and you can see how the septocutaneous perforator is dissected out. We can divide the whole septum once we have visualized the vessel, and that also allows us a lot of mobility. So this is the proximal peroneal perforator that you can see. It is supplying the skin, gone through the muscle, and now it is being dissected along the lateral side of the uh, fibula. And you see, you carry on following this. It will go up to the posterior leg, and then there are some variations. So, and in this patient, it was quite sizable, as you can make out. And that is the main pedicle as well as we do subsequent dissection under the microscope and we trace out the peroneal vessel and free it from whatever remaining bone that we want to retain. So that helps us to create these sort of chimeric flaps. So now you look at the CT angio, and if you look at it closely, you will be able to see that this is the perforator that we are talking about, the one with the arrow. And this is the proximal peroneal perforator on which we are going to bait our proximal island. So again, the illustration to show you the anatomy clearly, the anterior tibial has branched out. Then there is the common tibioperoneal trunk, which is bifurcated into posterior tibial and peroneal. And from the peroneal, you get the branch which is coming out, the proximal peroneal. This is a sizable perforator. It is constant. We have, in 95% of the patients, we have found this perforator. And we call this type 1 when it arises from the peroneal vessel. So this is a type 1. So why? I'll just tell you. So let's look at it again. So now if we look at this, this is how the anatomy is. The peroneal. The proximal peroneal perforator supplying a skin island proximally and a distal, the conventional fibula osteocutaneous, where we have multiple perforators, we can make it into multiple islands depending on what is required. And this picture shows you an example of how it is. And that is the perforator that is there. Another patient, and you can make out that is the proximal peroneal perforator islanded small skin island taken. You can see the small skin island and this is, so we can divide it into multiple components, the main vessel, and that's the proximal peroneal perforator. This is the classical design when we are taking the proximal peroneal perforator in our system. Now in the type one, as I told you, the proximal peroneal perforator is arising from the peroneal vessel. So if we do our anastomosis here, we are going to perfuse this whole flap. So now since we have two major, uh, two perfusing components, we can divide this into two. And the flap now has a large arc of rotation. I'll explain that to you how. If you look at this picture, now see, we have got long perforators on either side. This is the main vessel, of course, and that's the fibula component, and this is one proximal peroneal. Once we bring this pedicle down, towards the neck for our anastomosis, this also moves anteriorly. So this component also moves along with this length of the pedicle. So this helps us in covering 
large defects. An example, again, Doppler mapped. This is a type one perforator where the per proximal peroneal perforator is arising from the peroneal vessel. And a large central defect of the mandible, floor of the mouth, part of the tongue, uh, reconstructed. So with this flap, as you can see, the bone and the skin component cover and how much flexibility we are getting. We have moved that skin island right from the back and it has come right forward. And this is the uh, intra-op picture of the inset. Now coming to the other variations. So we have the proximal peroneal perforator type two. What is the type two? Type two is where the perforator is arising not from the peroneal, but from the common tibioperoneal trunk. So if it is going to arise from the tibioperoneal trunk, obviously we cannot uh, use that flap. We can't divide it proximal to that. So, so we'll have a different variation. Let me explain that to you again. So here you can see we have the tibioperoneal trunk from which the proximal peroneal uh, perforator has arisen. So we can't, uh, we have to divide the perforator at that level and use this as a separate component. So we have a peroneal component with its constituents, composite uh, compound elements, bone, skin, muscle, whatever you want to do. And we have a separate flap from the same donor site, close to the, but not, which is arising from the tibioperoneal trunk. So this gives you what we have done. And we have the peroneal vessels with its perforator components and the separate. So here we require to do two separate anastomoses. So we'll have to do two separate anastomoses because if you need to divide this, then it becomes two flaps from the same donor site, but two anastomoses are definitely required. So again, to illustrate the type, this is an intrinsic independent. So that means it is not from the same source vessel, it's from two different source vessels, which is perfusing this flap. And this is an example to show you again, another patient with two different source vessels one carrying the bone and skin, then you divide it and one part has been used for the central mandible and the skin as a separate skin fast. And this has been anastomosed separately to the recipient vessel in the neck. So it's two flaps from the same donor site and uh, inset into a single defect. And this is the patient post radiotherapy with a good, reasonably good result. We also have a type three where it is arising even from the popliteal. The perforator is known to arise from the popliteal. It is unusual, but it basically in type 2 and 3, it's the same. We do not dissect right up to the popliteal. We just get a sizable length, and once we are comfortable, we can use it. So if we go through this again, we have three types, and we did a study of CTO angiograms in 20 normal patients. That means 40, 40 limbs, and we found that in uh, the type 1, where it is arising from the peroneal, is present in 60%, 65% of the uh, CT angios. And the type 2 arose in 22.5, so about 9 limbs. The remaining where more or less uh, frequent uh, was from more proximal area. And most of this time, the, these perforator, the proximal peroneal is about 1 to 1.2 millimeter diameter, and the vein is also sizable for an anastomosis. And we do get a pedicle length of 4 to 6 centimeter, but the dissection is mostly intramuscular, and so we need to do an intramuscular uh, uh, dissection, which, 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 which might take a little bit of time. So if you look at the classification system, so this is a schematic representation to show you if we have the fibula, the conventional fibula, we can have a skin, one skin island, we can deepithelize in between. This is a type A conventional. We have not segregated it into a perforator blade, which is a classical fibula flap. A type B where we have set, divided the skin into two islands, which is the conventional distal skin, based on its different perforators. This gives us more flexibility, allowing each island to move in different planes. 
And this can be done once we've identified the operators. There's a type B. And a type C is when we have also included the proximal peroneal perforator, which gives us three basic components, including bone and maybe muscle as and what is required. So now we come to a situation where we have patients where we have previously operated vessel depleted neck and or a very short pedicle. So in those scenarios, what we do is instead of anastomosing the type two pattern flap uh, into the neck, we hitch it up to a side branch of the peroneal system. There are constant large soleal branches, which everybody knows, uh, proximally supplying. So if you keep a little bit of the length, you can detach this and hook it up into the peroneal system here. So suddenly from a type two, that means a type two or three pattern, we have converted this into a type one pattern by an intra operative fabrications. By doing an internal perforator to perforator anastomosis, we can do that. So the flap has been moved into a different sort of a recipient. All this is done on the table while the flap is being perfused. And this gives you an example how we have shifted it. And we have anastomosed this. You will note that we have two flaps and we've sutured them to prevent avulsion while this anastomosis is going on. So one example, a large defect with an ulceration in the oral cavity, including the mandible and involving the uh, outer skin. This is the fibula with its soleal branch, which has been detached. And this is hooked onto the uh, a side branch of the fibula osteocutaneous. This shows you how it is oriented. The proportion you can make out, the vessels are pretty small, but they are about one millimeter, and you can anastomose them without much of a discomfort if you are conversant with these sort of anastomosis. So this shows you a pa that patient. Now here what we required was a skin flap for the palatal and uh, upper alveolar side and a separate one for the floor of the mouth. And we uh, used two flaps anastomosed to each other with bone to reconstruct. Usually these are required for very specific cases. And this is a patient who came to us uh, with a recurrent disease after having undergone surgery earlier elsewhere. And uh, of course needed a large excision, secondary procedure, of course, the neck was depleted, had undergone a neck dissection earlier. So, and this is how we again hooked it up, put a large flap there and a large flap intraorally. And this was her, uh, this was the patient uh, post-operatively after, after, after some time, uh, otherwise doing well. So, this is another patient where you see we have used it for the tongue where the, we use a separate flap for the floor of the mouth and a separate flap for the ventral and lateral, per, per, lateral surface of the tongue. So here also we can combine these sort of procedures and fabricate them. One, I think uh, we'll be uh, coming to the concluding part and I'll just let you know. So this is a patient who came to us with a large tumor, of course required a large excision and his ITF also needed to be cleared and we were addressing defects more anteriorly. This is the proximal peroneal perforator taken, a conventional that what I have just described to you. So skin flap, skin bone, muscle component here, etc. So what did we do? We thought we needed multiple components here. So now you see what we have done. We have hooked up, that's a mandible. So you've got a skin flap there. We've taken uh, intrinsically patterned muscle in there. We have joined a skin flap paddle here, and then we have joined the gracilis as a, a sequential attachment to this flap. So this is the pattern that we have done. So because we've joined these components together, and we've used the gracilis to fill up the infratemporal fossa, and then we have lining, infra inframandibular, and the fibula. So we are trying to address the more complex, 
Now, what is happening is because we are trying, we are addressing these sort of complex defects. We are being challenged again by the head and neck deem by providing more and more such sort of a defect. So these are these are the challenges that we are facing. Whether these are rehabilitating the patient. I know the quality of life may be compromised with such sort of extensive uh, resections, but we are trying to face the challenge and addressing this with time. And this is him uh, after his uh, radiation. So to again describe type one, where the, per uh, the, the proximal peroneal perforator is located from the peroneal artery, type two, where it is uh, from the tibioperoneal trunk, and type 3 is where we detach it from the tibioperoneal trunk and attach it to the uh, peroneal system. So again, this can be subclassified into the proximal peroneal system into various types, C1, 2, 3, and these are certain cl classifications we have proposed. So the indications are for complex defects which require more than one component for reconstruction. So this is not usual standard reconstructions, please do not uh, take home the message that this is required for most of the patients. These are required for very specific patients and only in, I'm just trying to put forward that there is a possibility of modifying your surgery in such a way that you can address most of them through a single flap by doing these sort of proteins. There may be a paucity of recipient vessels. In those situations, these flaps are uh, indicated. Or if this, there is a very short perforator pedicle, then you can join this to the side branch. And if the intrinsic perforators only permit, then you can do these sort of procedures. So what are the limitations? Of course, the perforator anatomy is variable. So we cannot predict this. This can be decided only in the uh, on the table. We have to do two anastomoses. And chances of a pedicle or a perforated torsion is, of course, there. So one has to be very careful once we are doing this, because we can't presume that from a conventional uh, branch-based pattern, where we presume that the anastomosis is one anastomosis will perfume all the components. Here we'll have to monitor both the pedicles because either of them can uh, can face a problem, and so the monitoring has to be done for both the islands not just a single island. So <clears throat> uh, this is nothing uh, very new, though it is uh, limited to certain centers only, that these, uh, these practices have been going on and has been published. And if you look at an article published by Fu Chan Wei, he has compared the types. So when you look at the classical branch-based type, the vessels are large, you don't have much variation. That means, let's say the descending branch and the transverse branch, we don't have much variation. and But we have a large donor site, so uh, you might have to graph that area. And the technique is usually easy because the vessel size is big. But when you look at perforator-based patterns and we try to manipulate that, then the vessels are small. <clears throat> the morbidity is less because we are using a very small flaps uh, to change it and we may need intramuscular. But when you start doing a microsurgically prefabricated type, then it all depends on which anatomical site you're uh, comfortable with, you're doing with. The anatomic variation is not much because you're uh, creating the anatomy there or recreating the anatomy there. And there is a variability in the donor site. It might be big, it might be small. And of course, we need microsurgical skills to do it. Oshima in 2001 published this article, Classification of Free Combined or Connected Tissue Transfers, which described uh, the variety of combinations of these sort of flaps. And these are all well described, and these are all uh, can be practiced depending on what the anatomy is, and some of that I have just illustrated. So let us go back with this. What is our data? This is, I'm just taking a small window from 14 to 17 that we had compiled, just to give you a perspective. So of 2000 plus cases that we had operated at Tata Medical Center, only 428 underwent uh, reconstruction using various free flaps. So our free flap uh, requirement for these head and neck cancer 
is, let's say, around uh, 20 percent, one fifth of it. And of this, majority of our patient uh, cohort is <clears throat> for advanced disease. So you can make out that of the flaps that we have done, 50 percent are basically recurrent or recurrent tumors which are coming back to us, et cetera. So that is where we are, uh, these sort of flaps are more and more being useful. And we have done only eight in that window. Now, of course, as a total, we have done about 12 patients with fabricating flaps. So just a take home message that it is not a requirement as a conventional practice. Our conventional practice carries on as it is. And in certain situations, we need to only do this. So please don't go home and try and do this for all patients. It is meant for specific patients and it has to be well thought of and well planned before you execute these sort of procedures. I thank you very much for your attention and uh, it has been a great pleasure to uh, present this work uh, to y'all. And of course, I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. It was a wonderful presentation, basically. basically. But uh, well, let me start with sir. Is it Dr. Radhakrishnan here, sir? Yes, Dr. Radhakrishnan. Yeah. yeah. How are you, sir? <coughs> sir, I'm basically, mm, yeah. Yeah. You were, uh, all this uh, CT which you are doing is uh, MDCT or uh, regular CT angio itself, you take it, sir? No, this is MDCT. We don't do it as a routine. This was just a study that I showed you. We don't do routine CTs in any procedures. This we did just study when we were studying the proximal peroneal perforator. And most of your decisions will be based on table dissection of perforators. On table. Yes, on, on the table. It is an intraoperative decision making, intraoperative planning, and uh, <clears throat> see, we have uh, we are always working simultaneously as two teams. Yes. So whenever the head and neck starts working, we start elevating our flap. Once we've elevated our flap, then we look at the anatomy. If the anatomy yes, yes. is uh, feasible, then we just hold on to everything. And once the specimen is out, then we decide what we are going to do. Do we require a simple? Of course, we have a, something in our mind for uh, looking at the head and neck CT that we are going to discuss it with our head and neck team that they are going to do this. So then we decide only in certain complex cases that we decide how to uh, adjust the flap. Can we do it? Can we take this perforator? So all that is taken on the table. So it's 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 mostly um, decision on table decision. You go in for uh, this kind of. Uh, this yeah, plan. there is no way to pre plan this. Yeah. There is no way that you can yeah. decide that we are going to do it. But the proximal peroneal perforator is constant. It is only in 5% cases we didn't get it. But in so you can cover majority of the defects using Daddy. conventional fibula as well as the Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. That's a wonderful presentation, sir. Actually, thank you. We, we wanted to listen to your uh, reanimation also, facial reanimation also. <laughs> I was That's telling right. Sandeep next, <laughs> next uh, some other time. Yeah, some time. Yes. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, it's a really uh, wonderful presentation and uh, uh, cases shown are uh, very uh, dramatic results uh, are there. And uh, uh, for uh, using this, uh, doing this uh, perforator to perforator anastomosis, what suture materials you use, sir? And uh, magnification is the same uh, uh, microscope, operative microscope, or anything like Stand and microscope. I think uh, uh, Dr. Sandeep will vouch for, uh, vouch for this. I think they, everybody's practicing. We use a standard Johnson 3314-10-0 suture, which is available. We don't use uh, we don't use 110, which is difficult to get, but we Sorry. don't use 110. Expensive 10-0 is sufficient. And uh, as I said, with the small vessels, we can put in three to four, uh, three to five sutures easily in these sort of uh, vessels. And we use the standard microscope. We have a vario, 
and of course we have a OPMI also, but uh, it's a standard microscope available, nothing fancy. Okay. So it was fantastic, sir. Uh, we don't have any questions in the chat box. Normally we get some questions in the chat box. Uh, I just have a few questions, sir. Uh, regarding your, uh, uh, I mean, a lot of take-home messages are there in your talk. So one of the things that I wanted to ask is when you're actually taking the reverse uh, radial forearm flap, uh, do you get all the, I mean, uh, the, and the proximal portion of the uh, forearm do you get a septocutaneous perforator or is it a, a musculocutaneous perforator that you get? No, we get a septocutaneous perforators are there. There are skin. Uh, we have done maybe about 10 or 12 uh, distally based radial forearm flaps. See, we are conventionally doing distally based forearm flaps, pedicle for the hand. Yeah. So I don't know why we are hesitant to do free flaps. So that's the straight. Uh, so there were a lot of discussions regarding uh, congestion, etc., because of the reverse flow of the veins, etc. But it have it does happen. It does appear to be a little congested for the first day, but after that uh, we have never had a problem with the veins. The only problem is you will have to do the vena comitantes. You can't do yes. the superficial veins. So the vena comitantes is very small at the wrist. It's a little bigger in the proximal part, but the distally it is small. So that's a technical disadvantage. Other than that, uh, we have not had a problem, but there are sizable perforators which are or sizable branches which are going and supplying the muscles around that site. So those become good sites for recipient vessels. So my idea is, which I'm looking at, is to hitch in more flaps onto that system. So it makes it job. See, the radial forearm, the problem is that if you are trying to make it into multiple components, you will have to fold that radial forearm. So you cannot, you okay. cannot, uh, you cannot uh, have it in the axis that you walk. So you'll either make it into a double fold, and then only you can use your two islands or three islands. But if you have it with a branch, then you don't have to fold. Then you're comfortable. Now, whether it is required, not required, see, your elevation of a radial forearm flap is uh, 45 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes exercise. So you finish all this on the table while the head and neck is doing their excision and neck dissection. So it's a simple uh, idea, and I think it makes it more flexible for the surgeon. So that is just an avenue that we need to explore. I think younger guys like you all should now uh, step in and push the limits of these into uh, different areas. Uh, so another thing is that, uh, have you been able to do the closure primarily of the uh, donor site for the radial rate, uh, forearm? No, no, no. So Some we have, the it is then, most of the time, uh, these large defects always graft, always graft. That is, a, that is but, one issue uh, that is also in our mind. Even peroneal area, uh, once we take skin like this, we need to graft that donor site, which is always a problem, both in the fibula and the hand. ALT, you can close quite a bit of the area. We are using the A. Sometimes uh, um, uh, my colleague is very proficient in using the AMT for ALT donor site closures, etc. But uh, we have tried free flaps uh, back to the uh, forearm donor side closer, free flaps, donor side, but I don't think that is a practical, that is okay uh, for a presentation, but not for a routine use. So donor sites are an issue, and that is the one point that has to be emphasized. We have to try and minimize the donor site uh, problems. Of course, we have closed but it primarily in radial forearm by uh, the, uh, pre like I think uh, Dr. Subramaniam, Subramaniam is thin flaps and uh, suturing it together, et cetera, and creating it wide enough that we have done, but those are very selected cases. So, uh, but most of the cases you would have been able to close the distal portion, which is actually the problematic area, sir. Distal portion of the hand? Uh, radial forearm, hand, hand, distal portion. Yeah, radial distal radial portion radial of the radial. hand. We can't, we, we have been unable to close it completely without causing some compromise in the skin. We have always in 90% are grafted. 
very few has but, been closed for but the because you're taking it as a reverse flow flyer no ah, i'm you, sorry i'm sorry you're talking about the our patient reverse flow ah, yes, yes sir ah, i'm yes, talking sir. about standard radial forearm Aha, yeah, okay. reverse to reverse to see the skin island will be centered just below the elbow so that is the area we'll graft the one in the forearm distal forearm is closed primarily yes the but scar the, now shifts the, from the wrist to a more proximal level and uh, this definitely can be used in a lot of areas also it's, uh, because the thing is suddenly got me thinking of when we do the phalloplasties also i think uh, this would be a wonderful idea to actually yeah. use the the uh, reverse flow radial forearm flap so i look forward to your presentation <laughs> yeah i think long as it stirs some ideas that is what is the whole intent it stirs yes. some ideas and we need people to jump into this and then we see how things move yeah. see so the, i think... tell you one more thing when when i first did my uh, sequential flap that was uh, way back in the late 80s so i was concerned now when do we put our clamps so do we put our clamps after division of the pedicle if we do that will the second flap thrombos or after anastomosis do we do that second flap then do we clamp it will it thrombos so these things were always in our mind so there was a lot of discussion of not doing these procedures because you sequential flaps you will lose both the flaps by doing all this but you find that with the small perforators is never a problem we put in clamps prior to detachment always uh, after detachment uh, on the table after detachment and we've not had a problem the basic premise of anastomosis has to be followed no clots no nothing like the lumen is well irrigated etc do you do any special for these supermicro surgery cases do you do give any no. additional Maybe have parent or let's yeah, say yeah. you know something. Yeah, we we uh, we have again the whole spectrum of management. Presently, what we are doing is, of course, flushing with heparin, one five thousand solution that we standard that is a standard practice, and we give claxine, claxine forty that is the uh, new heparin that we are giving while the patient uh, before releasing the clamp. and we continue giving it for the next 3 to 5 days that's all whether that is required i can't answer maybe we don't require it but for the perforator for the sake of you know sleeping easy we we use it so so definitely you have actually uh, covered a lot of topics today i think because uh, you know uh, reverse uh, flow radial forearm flap you have actually talked a lot about the, the, the entire gamut of the pre, uh, fabricated flaps because that is actually a uh, question also that is asked for the university exams and mcs so i think uh, a lot of interest would be there among the young surgeons uh, the residents especially it would be actually in the exams also and for the the it has really stirred a lot of uh, ideas uh, i expect like uh, so many so many things are going on in the head Uh, seeing your presentation that is wonderful sir your presentation Thank thanks a lot once again thank you thank you doctor